Okay, welcome back everybody to another episode of Inside the Black Box. And today's black box is literally a black box. Now I'm sure this is a black box that many people are familiar with because of course this is the Atari 2600 video game cartridge. Uh, this is probably one of the most popular um, early versions of a video game cartridge. Um, Atari was not the first company of course to use a cartridge format for their video games. Uh, the first machine to actually use a cartridge was of course the Fairchild Channel F. Um, it is the design team that decided to use a cartridge format, worked for that company. Uh, and the, interestingly, the reason they decided to go down the uh, route of making it a cartridge and not some other shape uh, is because uh, they were inventing basically a new medium, right? Video games were a new thing. Um, people had barely gotten used to Pong machines, which was a box you plug into your TV. This idea of a game that you could change was completely new. So they wanted to make sure that people would know how to use it kind of right off the bat without having to have instructions and complicated education. Um, so what they did was they looked at the closest similar thing that already existed, and that was an 8-track music tape, right? Uh, the 8-track tape kind of looked like a regular music cassette, but was much bigger and chunkier. It kind of looked like an oversized video game card in a way. Uh, and the way that worked was you would plug it into your 8-track player, press play and then listen and when you wanted to switch tapes you press stop, remove it and put the next one in. So they decided to essentially use that same user experience uh, for the video games and then people would kind of just know intuitively what to do. So it's a very nice example of uh, reuse. And of course once the Channel F was successful, uh, other video game companies decided to follow suit. It became the kind of you know default way of doing video games. Uh, but of course the uh, 2600 became the company that made uh, console games, famous, and then of course almost killed them forever, right, during the uh, game crash of the early 80s. So this particular cartridge, uh, it's a Pac-Man cartridge, I got this at Goodwill, uh, it's uh, in pretty bad shape, so we're going to open this up and see what, uh, what makes it work. Um, if I snap something, I won't be too sorry, it's got all kinds of writing and crap over it. I'm actually not even sure this works, to be honest. I tried it once and I got some uh, glitchy stuff on the screen, but anyway. Uh, the internals are what matter, so let's see how we take this thing apart. Before we open it though, let's have a look at it on the outside. Um, first thing you notice about this thing is the sides. It kind of really fits nicely in your hand. And that is important, right, because in the 2600, uh, you had to kind of insert this thing and remove it with a fair amount of force. So you wanted to have a nice shape that you could really, you know, grab hold of. Uh, so from that point of view, it's nice. When we open this up, you'll see that the actual internals are much smaller than the cartridge. Uh, the size are really there to give it a, a good uh, good shape and I guess you know if you're selling this later you want it to appear looking nice on the shelf uh, so the other interesting feature about these uh, uh, Atari cartridges of course is the uh, the entry point here um, they've got a kind of plastic shielding you it's got a kind of trapdoor which you can't push it's got a special mechanism with a spring and a lock where you actually can't open this unless you push these two kind of spaces with a special tab, which is what you find inside the uh, Atari machine itself. So I have here um, a 3D print apart from another project which has the correct shape for accepting these cartridges. And so you'll notice that it's got these two kind of tabs that stick out. This is a copy of the shape of the internals of a uh, Atari machine. So if you've got this here, and then as you insert the cartridge, those two tabs kind of connect, and then you can in insert the cart all the way, right? Um, so that's kind of how they locked the door. The reason they did that was they were trying to protect the cart edge connector. Um, the concern was, hey, if that connector gets scratched, if the pins become uh, hard to make a contact, then the game will stop working, right? Um, and of course, as every Nintendo owner knows, that's true. Like, if you leave these things around for long enough, they do stop working. Although, uh, the biggest enemy of cartridge uh, connectors is not scratching any kind of mechanical damage, it's actually rust, right? When they oxidize, that's when uh, you start getting the bad connections in the game failing. So anyway, let's uh, open this guy up and then see what makes it tick. Um, the way you open up one of these cartridges, you've got to kind of lift up the label. Uh, this one's kind of already coming off, so you know it's probably been sitting in someone's attic and like covered in cat hair and like cigarette smoke or something. Uh, but anyway, let's lift it up. If I rip it, I'm not going to be too sorry, but you know, out of respect for the guys who worked all night to get this thing launched, we'll try and be careful. Uh, oh. Okay, there we go. So I'll put that aside, try to glue it back. Okay, it's pretty simple. You've got a single screw and then one of these kind of uh, tab and lift things. Um, it's got a sticker on top, which you actually do need to get rid of to separate because it kind of is across the dividing line, but this one's already coming off, so we can just leave it as is. All right, so let me remove that screw. 
Um, it's uh, interesting that it has a screw because normally you'd have a screw on a piece that you want to open later for repairing. And there aren't actually any repairable parts in here, so I kind of find that interesting. Anyway, let's uh, let's pop that open. Get in there. I think that is what we have. Nope. All right. Okay, so after a lot of grunting and pulling, we finally got it open. It's almost as if they didn't want you opening these things up. Hmm. Anyway, there it is. Uh, it's got a bunch of latches on the side, which is what was catching. Um, so here we go. Uh, this is what it looks like internally. You've got this part, which is the actual uh, game cartridge itself. The magic is here. Uh, and then this is the kind of uh, locking trapdoor mechanism. So let me open that up and show you what it looks like. Um, so this is the trapdoor. It's got a uh, slot through which the card connector pokes. So it kind of slides through here like this, and then it'll plug in like that, right? Uh, and then it's got a little trap door which kind of sits in here and swings which is what opens and closes it And then at the very bottom we have a spring which is what keeps the whole thing uh, kind of closed when you're not using it But the interesting stuff really is this thing um, This is the actual cartridge itself and you can see essentially if we look on the back You can see that there are 24 pins there. So there is a single chip here, which is hidden behind this shield uh, Which is what does the magic so what is a shield all about? Like if you take apart uh, electronics from the 70s, you find these things all over the place. Like if you open up an NES machine, it is covered in a giant metal shield. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is uh, during the 1970s, there is a government body in the US called the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. And their job is to make sure that uh, all communications devices uh, just operate and don't interfere with each other, right? So televisions, telephones, uh, music systems, uh, and video game consoles, because they interoperated with televisions, fell under the purview of the FCC. And the FCC was concerned that, hey, what if these new devices start emitting all kinds of radio frequencies that are going to interfere with, for example, people watching TV or, you know, 911 dispatches, radio transmissions. So uh, they decided that, hey, we should put metal shielding that actually blocks these electromagnetic radiation from escaping around all of these uh, devices. And it's very common. You see it all over the place. Um, eventually, this rule was dropped because I guess, you know, uh, at some point you do a bunch of testing and you get to know the technology well enough that you realize, hey, it's not a problem. Uh, part of the reason you don't see this anymore is electronics is built in a different way today. So you kind of don't have that problem anymore. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like cell phones on airplanes, right? I mean, at some point you've tested enough and understand the problem well enough that you realize, yeah, we were concerned. But now that we have the data, we realize it's not a problem. Uh, so. How many pins do we have at the bottom of this thing? And this is kind of where it starts to get interesting. Um, so they are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 on this side and another 12 on that side. And if you count, there are 12 legs here as well on each side of the, uh, the chip. So <clears throat> not all of these legs are connected. For example, if you look at this one here, it kind of goes up to a dead end. Um, what we would expect to find here is we would expect to find uh, a plus five volts because of course you need electricity to drive this. You don't get anything for free, right? Uh, you need ground, which is where the electricity is gonna return to because every circuit has to be a continuous loop. And then we would expect to find 16 other pins that actually do something. Now, why 16? The reason we would expect to see 16 is because the Atari 2600 was an eight bit machine. And in order to uh, work with eight bits, you need to have eight bits to indicate where you want to go in memory to fetch something and then eight bits to actually carry the data back to the machine. So let's stop for a minute before we take the shield off, go to the whiteboard and look at what does it mean to be an eight bit machine. Okay, so let's talk about what it means to be an eight bit or a 16 bit or whatever bitness you like computer. Um, essentially the problem you're trying to solve in memory is this. I need to be able to take something, put it in a place where I can find it again, uh, store it there, and then when I need it, be able to reach back and grab exactly that thing uh, and use it for whatever reason, right? That's the basic problem that memory solves. So the first question we like to ask about memory is, okay, so how much stuff can we store? Um, so when you are trying to move data between your memory and your processor, uh, the CPU of the video game console, uh, you are moving things through something called the data bus. And the bus is a special uh, contraption in electronics engineering. Um, it's kind of complicated, but the simple way to think about it is it, it is a set of connections or cables through which 
something moves, in this case, data. So how much data can we move through this data bus? So imagine that you had just one cable. So let's say you've got your CPU up here and here you've got your memory, your memory chip, right? Oh, let's make them look like chips, give them some legs. All right, so how much memory can I move across here? Imagine I connected one cable between these two, right? How much stuff can I move across here at a time? Well, I can only move one thing at a time, right? I can send a signal from here to here, wait for it to arrive, okay, send the next one and so on. Uh, Remember that in electronics things, we always move data one bit at a time, and a bit is a thing that is either one or zero, right? So in essence, I can move a single one or a zero through here. So there are two things that can move through this data bus, two possibilities. You're either a one or a zero. That's it. Now, what if we add another cable to this? What if we take our data bus, and now instead of being a, having a width of one cable, it's got a width of two cables, right? How much stuff can I move through there? Well, suddenly I have a lot of options because the first cable can be zero and the second cable can be zero at the same time because these are independent cables, right? Or I can have the first one be zero and the second one be one, or it can be any of these possibilities, right? Any of these states can exist in these two cables. So how many different things is that? One, two, three, four. So now I can move four different things between two cables. What happens if I add a third cable? Well, now I add another number, and essentially what you do is every cable you add, you multiply the possible number of things by two. So with one cable, you can move two things. With two cables, you can move four things. With three, you can move eight, and so on. And the formula here is really two to the power of however many bits, right? So if I have a data bus width of eight, so in other words, eight of these cables, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I can move two to the power of eight things simultaneously across, which is 256. So in other words, in an eight bit data bus, I can move a number which is anywhere between zero and 255, right? And that is essentially the amount of, uh, the single unit of memory, which is called a word, just like, you know, when you speak a spoken language, a word is the smallest thing that you communicate with. The, the kind of fundamental unit of an 8-bit computer is any one of 0 to 255 different numbers. And if this were a 16-bit computer, then what we would have is 16 of these cables going across the data bus. And then you have suddenly a very large number. Then you can move one of 65,536 possible numbers between uh, the CPU and the memory, right? So that is the data bus. Now, that is not enough to be able to get the information across because this is just for a single word of memory, right? This is how much stuff I can store in one word. What if I want to have many different words? Like I want one word to describe the number of lives I have. I want another word to describe which level I'm on. I want another word to describe perhaps the color of my hat, right? So how do we have different words of memory um, inside this architecture? Okay, so the data bus then allows the processor to actually read or write a value. And so you've got your words of memory, and each one can store a number in an 8-bit system between 0 and 255, right? Because that is the width of your data bus. So you can store a number that is that value. And like I said, of course, you, you want to have uh, your CPU up here wants to be able to deal with many different numbers. Perhaps this word stores, you know, the number of lives or the level you're on or the color of Mario's hat, whatever it is, right? So how does the CPU, how is it able to point here and say, okay, I want lives, which is stored here. And now I want to know which level I'm on in the game. And that's stored here. So I need to go to this guy. How does it know to reach to this particular word or that particular word? Okay, and that's where the second interesting bus in uh, between uh, CPUs and memory comes in, and that's called the address bus. That's usually addressed as ADDR. And so the problem that the address bus solves is basically the same thing that happens when you try to phone a friend and tell them something, right? How do you reach out to a friend and give them some piece of information? How do you phone a friend and say, dude, I'm on level seven of Mario? Well, the way you do that is very simple. You have your friend's telephone number, right? So you grab that number, you go to the telephone, enter the number, that connects you to your friend, and then you can say 27. So that's essentially what happens in the address bus. Um, the device which you use to connect you 
to any of the words, right? This is you, this is your friend that you're trying to communicate with. This piece in the middle is the address bus, that's the telephone. And so now all we need to do is we need to have the phone number that we can uh, reach your friend with. So the way that um, the address is stored works like this. And again, it comes down to this idea of bitness, right? Let's say that you lived in a really small town. You might only need a, a phone number that has a single digit, right? So let's say you live in a town with five people. It's like, oh, you're gonna, what's your phone number? Oh, call me at three, or I'm seven. So a single digit, let's put, actually let's put a, a nine here. So a single digit is your phone number because there's only five people who live in this town. We can fit all five people inside a single digit, no problem, right? Uh, let's say that a few more people move to town. Uh, so the sixth person moves into town, that's okay. They get telephone number six. The seventh person, the eighth person, the ninth person moves into town. Now they get assigned the number nine. What happens when the 10th person moves into your town? Well, you can't give them a phone number anymore. We've run out of phone number space, right? The width of the phone number is not enough to support the 10th person. So we need to add an additional number to support that 10th person. And that might seem like a lot of work for just one person to get phone calls. But remember, now we are able to store 100 people's worth of phone numbers, right? So it's actually worth doing. And in fact, more people keep coming to your town. When we get to the 101st person, we need to add another digit to support them and so on. And so as people move into your town, you need to increase the width of your telephone number to be able to assign the phone numbers, right? So again, you'll notice with one digit, we can have 10 people's phone numbers stored. With two, we can have 100. With three, we can have 1,000. So it gets kind of exponentially larger. Um, and it's the same with bitness. The address bus stores the phone number, which is actually the address of each of these words in a single number, except it's a binary number, right? It's not a decimal number. So 8-bit architecture CPUs, just like having an 8-bit um, data bus, typically will have the same width address bus, although that's not always true. But for the kinds of uh, processor that were typically used in video game consoles, it's always true. Uh, so for example, in the uh, MOS 6502, which is the CPU that powered the Commodore 64 and the Atari 2600, a very popular CPU from the 80s, that had an 8-bit address bus. And that means that we could have 256 addresses, words of memory, right? So now you can do a little bit more math and figure out how much stuff can I store inside this computer? Well, you have 256 words, each of which can have 256 values. So the total amount of storage you have in this computer is each word can store one of 256 values multiplied by 256 words gives you 65,536, which is basically 64 kilobytes, right? And that's why a lot of these 8-bit computers maxed out at 64 kilobytes of memory because they had an 8-bit data bus and an 8-bit address bus. Okay, so let's, uh, now that we understand what it means to be an 8-bit machine and understand how memory basically works, uh, let's take the shield off and have a look underneath and see what the chip looks like. Um, it's kind of, the shield is kind of held on top by two solder joints, so we're just gonna undo those quickly. Uh, the idea is not to burn myself too badly. Come on, and a little more. Almost there. And there we go. Okay. All right, so that's the metal shield. It's just a nice piece of aluminum that's been folded. Uh, this is the actual cartridge. That's all there is to it. One single chip. It is read-only memory. It's a ROM. Uh, it contains the code, the graphics, the sound, everything, right? Everything that is in this game. And if you look at it, you can see that it's a uh, Atari, Atari branded part, uh, and it's got a code up there. The code corresponds to the game which is in here, which is Pac-Man, right? Uh, and so what they would do is in the, uh, the developers would write the code on a regular computer, and they would then send the code uh, through magnetic tape uh, to the Atari factory and there would be a machine that would transfer that magnetic code and burn it into these chips, right? So the game is physically hardwired into this chip uh, and you can get to it by means of the address and data buses, okay? So that's what a uh, console game looks like of the time. What about uh, computer games uh, of the time? So of course, cartridges were used by computers too. So here is an example of a computer game that was shipped in a, a console. This is for the VIC-20, it's a game called Super Smash. 
uh, not related to Super Smash Brothers. This thing would have been out in probably like 81 or something like that, 82 maybe. Um, it is uh, produced by Commodore, of course, for their uh, VIC-20 machine. And what's interesting about this is the kind of difference in construction and quality between this and the Atari cartridge. Um, we saw that the Atari cartridge and the nice little trapdoor that kind of keeps everything secure and clean. Um, Commodore, which was run by Jack Tramiel, um, had took a very different road to producing quality. Jack Tramiel was notoriously cheap and he tried to cut corners wherever possible to save a buck. Uh, so we look at this uh, cartridge and there's the card cage connector right there. It's not protected by anything. It's out in the open. Um, and there is absolutely nothing preventing this thing from getting damaged, right? And the reason they probably did that is they figured, well, you know, how long is this thing going to last? I mean, users are going to want to play with this thing for a couple of years and then they're going to get sick of it or they will have moved on to the next great Commodore machine. So this is good enough to last that lifetime. And those are kind of typical choices you make in engineering, right? You say, yeah, this thing is cool, but we only need it to last for so long. So, you know, why spend the energy to make it last any longer? Uh, so let's pop it open and have a look to see what's inside. Um, I don't know if you can hear, but it's kind of like ominously creaky. It sounds super cheap. Uh, of course, the game would not have been cheap. This would have cost a pretty penny in the day. So let's take the one screw off and then see if we can open it. So very similar system to Atari. Uh, it's got some tabs over here again. Let's see if I can actually open these this time without needing. Oh, there's one. And this is like, man, this is already coming loose. It's like fantastic construction, Jack. Very nice. All right, so pop that. And now we got here, that one, and There we go. Oh, okay. At least I managed to keep my dignity on that one. Okay, so that's the box. This is the magic piece. Uh, similar to the uh, Atari, uh, it's kind of, you know, the cartridge is mostly empty space, right? Um, so we can put these side by side, and in some sense, they look very similar, right? The chips are basically the same size. That's probably because they're using very similar technology internally. Um, uh, what's interesting about the uh, Commodore uh, PCB is that it's got a bunch of uh, space here, which is unused. Uh, so we've got a bunch of interesting stuff here. Here's the part number, the revision B. Revision is kind of like the version number of a uh, electronics B. So it normally starts on A, then they improve it and it becomes B, they improve it becomes C and so on. Um, and it says December 8, probably means built in December 1978, uh, made in Hong Kong. Uh, so the other thing we see here is apart from the actual ROM chip, which contains, you know, again, the code and the sound and everything else, uh, there is this little capacitor here. Uh, and the reason this capacitor exists is because of the structure of the VIC-20 is different from the 2600. The designers of the VIC-20 had a concern that if there was a power spike, that would flow through this line to the MOS and potentially, to the CMOS and potentially damage it, right? So they put this little thing here, it acts kind of like a power spike or a filter. Uh, so that if something comes in, it will actually prevent that from damaging. So that's actually a pretty nice feature, which uh, maybe Atari could have had. Um, and you can see the design is very, very simple, right? Um, you've got the traces just go from the legs down to these pins and then they continue on the other side, right? Just everything traces and it just directly plugs into the address and data bus of the uh, CPU inside the VIC-20. So super simple. Uh, that is essentially then um, how memory works in these classic systems, uh, how it is that you're able to address this memory and why the 64K limit existed on uh, 8-bit machines. So I hope you enjoyed that look at uh, cartridges and memory and classic systems. Um, next time we are going to have a look at a Nintendo cartridge because as with the controllers we're going to see Nintendo made things in a way that seems more complex than necessary but actually uh, broke through a couple of barriers that existed with this technology and were able to add a lot of value to their products by doing that. Uh, so Next time, we'll crack open some interesting NES cartridges and have a look at how they did that. Uh, in the meantime, take care. We'll see you for the next one.